I really want to talk about today is creative destruction in uh, education. Because I think that these new online technologies are both going to allow us to be much more creative in teaching, and they're also going to have enormous changes in what is taught, in how it is taught, who is doing the teaching, how they're being paid, and so forth. I want to begin with the creative side, and then I'll turn and we'll talk a little bit more about the destructive side and some of these changes, what they're going to mean. So beginning with the creative side, the major benefit, one of the huge benefits of online education, of course, is scale. Right? So you can teach 10 people online uh, as cheaply as you can teach 10,000 or 100,000 people. And I think everyone here is familiar with the MOOCs. Everyone has heard about how some of these MOOCs have 60,000 students in them, 65,000 students, and so forth. So I'm not going to talk very much about scale, because I think that's been talked about a lot. People understand scale. But we'll come back a little bit later and talk about some of the implications uh, on the economics side of scale. More of what I want to spend some more time on is how these technologies actually allow us to teach that. <coughs> now, unfortunately, this is how some of our students are often, uh, often look at you know, 8 o'clock in the morning or something like that. Now, how can these technologies allow us to teach better? Well, one of the interesting things about them is that you know, I find teaching at uh, my <coughs> class at George Mason University, and 20% of my students, they're not getting it, they're not sort of following, it's very natural for me then to repeat myself. But that means that 80% of my students hear something twice, which they only needed to hear once. Now, in the online world, you never repeat yourself. You never repeat yourself in the online world. Because in the online world, the student is in control. The student can pause, the student can rewind, the student can even maybe speak faster if what you're saying is a little bit boring they already understand the material. Right? The student is much more in control in the online world. Here's another reason why online teaching would be better. This is what I call uh, time uh, chunking. So think about the typical class. Depending upon, you know, whether it's undergrad or a graduate class, it could be an hour in length, up to two hours and 50 minutes. Those are the longest types of classes we have at George Mason. I think two hours are standard in India. Now, that's a typical class. Now, why? Why this length? Let's compare. What is uh, a TED Talk? TED Talk, 18 minutes. Very, very popular TED Talks. What about a typical television drama segment? 12 minutes. And some commercials, you go have, have a drink, get a snack, 12 minutes. Uh, what about popular YouTube videos? Three to four minutes. So what does this tell us? I think what this tells us is that the optimal human attention span is more something between three and 18 minutes. So why are we teaching, you know, one hour, two hour, 15 minutes? It's because the fixed costs of getting everyone in the same room at the same time, the coordination costs of getting everyone together are so high that you want to cram as much knowledge as possible because it's just too costly to meet more time. So you meet fewer times and you make it longer. But that's not optimal. So in the online world, you can teach much closer to the optimal human attention span. This doesn't mean that you need to dumb things down. But what this means is that you chunk things. You break things up into more manageable uh, chunks, which are more consistent with the optimal human attention span. There's also uh, what I call time shifting. So some of you may recognize this. This is a, a TV guide. Right? This is from 1963. I'm sure you had similar things in India, but this TV guy tells you, if you wanted to watch Houdinan, you had to be in front of your television set Saturday night between 7.30 and 8.30. Okay? You couldn't watch it the next day. You couldn't pause and go get a beer or something like that. Right? You couldn't uh, 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 slow it down. 
You have to be where they told you to be at exactly the right time, and you have to be watching in order to see that. Now this, of course, is ancient technology, right? Today we have TiVo, we have the DVR, which means that you can pause your shows, they're recorded, they're there waiting for you. You can watch them when you want to watch them. Right? Today, we have entertainment on demand. Why can't we get education on demand? I can go home to Netflix, find some uh, movie. Why can't I get education on demand? So one way of thinking about uh, online technologies in this context is that what this means is, it, 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 it is that uh, 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 we can bring the benefits of TiVo to education. Here, that was ancient technology in 1963, but this is exactly what we're still doing today for education. So if you want to have, you know, Barbara Dawn for accounting, you have to be Wednesdays 8.15 to 9.40 a.m. in a specific place at a specific time. So even though we have much better technology for TV, we're doing ancient technology for education. So I like to say that online education does for education what TiVo has done for television, and what the DVR has done for television. Allows you to shift, allows you to shift time and when it's better for it. So we're doing, we're doing some of this at uh, MR University. This is our online uh, school for economics. Uh, let's see, can we click on this and see if we can go to the uh, uh, website? If we click. Just, yeah, click on the, on the slide and it should take us up to the website. We'll see if we have uh, that or not. Okay. There we go. Okay. So I want to show you uh, uh, one video. So let's go down to the video and. Uh, I'll start the video, I'll show you just a few minutes of this. And you can get the idea. That's okay. So let, let me just talk about one of the things that we can do uh, with this technology. Um, one of the interesting aspects is that all of our videos at MR University are captioned. So they're captioned in English, okay? But here's the interesting part. Once you caption them in English, Google auto-translates them automatically in something like 200 different languages. Okay? So you can also have captions in Hindi, in Tagalog, in Urdu, all of this provided automatically. Okay? Now the computer translations are not as good as human translations, but as we all know, they're getting much better all the time. So one of the issues with uh, education has always been the cost disease, right? Is that because education is labor intensive, that the costs rise over time. And if you think about Socrates, Socrates, you know, drew, uh, or Pythagoras, let's say, drew in the sand, okay, here's the triangle, right? And then what does a teacher today do? Well, they take some chalk maybe, and they draw on the board or maybe even PowerPoint, they're going, it's almost exactly the same. Okay? The technology of teaching has not improved in thousands of years. What online education does is it ties teaching to computer technology. And computer technology, artificial intelligence, the internet, communications, this is increasing at a tremendous rate. Productivity is increasing at a tremendous rate in all of these technologies. So online education trumps the cost of disease because online education now ties education to a productive sector, a growing sector of the economy, a capital intensive, a software intensive sector instead of a labor intensive sector. So we're going to see rapid improvements in education simply because they're tied to computer and software technology, including, for example, artificial intelligence, improving the translations which we offer uh, in hundreds of different languages. <coughs> now, uh, all of this wouldn't make very much of a difference if it didn't work. So we want to ask, does it work? There's been a number of uh, RCTs, randomized controlled trials, 
And uh, they all turn out pretty good in that uh, current online education techniques are at least as good as traditional techniques. So one of the best examples of this is a study by Bill Bowen and all of a statistics class where he compared an online uh, class, um, uh, which is uh, mostly online and uh, once a week uh, 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 in class, so sort of a hybrid, online hybrid model, to the traditional model. And what they found is whether you looked at a final exam, whether you look at a post-test, whether you looked at the pass rate, uh, orange is the online version, blue is the traditional version. So the online version was actually just a tiny bit, tiny bit better, not statistically significant, but at least as good and maybe slightly, slightly better in terms of what the students learned. <coughs> Moreover, the online model was 36% to 57% less costly to run than the traditional course. And if you think about that, what that means is since the outcomes were the same and the costs were much lower, it means that the productivity of the online model was 56% to 133% higher, much higher productivity. Uh, so again, online education trumps the cost disease. Moreover, these costs, the reduction in cost which Bowen measured, is just the cost to the university, and just the sort of teaching uh, costs. If you think about long run costs of having to build fewer buildings, costs could be even lower. So I think about India, for example, and uh, India and Africa, they have left <coughs> US technology because they went uh, fewer landlines, and think about telephones. They went straight to mobile phones, okay? fewer landlines. So I think as India and China are building new universities, they ought to leap over the traditional model of building, you know, here's, here's, a, here's the economics hall, and here's psychology hall, and here's this building putting in all this space, all these buildings, all this infrastructure, you have to leap over that, excuse me, and go straight to an online model. Moreover, as I said, these are just the cost of the university. The students actually have lower costs as well because what Bowen found is that the online students learn the same material in 25% less time. So they engage with the material 25% less. That's a significant cost savings in terms of time. Moreover, the online students, they didn't have to drive to the university and find parking, which is always a problem. So again, big cost savings to the students as well as to the university. Perhaps um, the place which has gone the farthest in this is Georgia Tech. They have created an entire uh, online master's degree. Now, Georgia Tech, it's a top 10 computer science program in the United States. This is not a minor university. This is a, a word center for computer science. Uh, they are now admitting annually about 1,700 students into the online program compared to about 1,200 <coughs> in the uh, traditional program. So uh, 1,700 students, annual admittance. Okay? So they've got four or 5,000 students actually in the program at any one point in time. Uh, in addition, this is actually now the largest master's in computer science in the world. They are graduating, just this one program, 7% of all the master's in computer science. Because it's so large, because you can make the online model, you can make the online uh, students make the classes very big, 1,700. There's no distinction in the degree between the online and the residential students. It's exactly the same degree. And what about the fees? You know, I'm coming to that. That is an excellent question. <laughs> okay, that is the that is the piece de resistance. So we will, we will come coming to that. So the grading was blind. The online students actually performed a little bit better. Okay, and the professors don't know which is online and which is not. And now the fees. Okay, seven thousand for the online, forty-five thousand for traditional method. Okay, so online education. It's the only credible way of reducing the cost of education. Uh, is the selection process the same for the student? Selection process is basically the same, correct. So um, uh, let, let me say a little bit uh, about the students, because that, that, that comes to this point. Selection process is essentially the same. The uh, online students 
uh, actually are older and a little bit less well-educated. And that's important because, so here's the distribution. This is the traditional on top, okay? And as you would expect, most of the traditional students are young, between 20, 20 and 25, that's the mode. Uh, in the online program, most of the students are older than that. Most of the students are over the age of 25, okay? And some of them, you know, are, you know, 50 and 60, okay? Now this makes sense because a number of these students in the online program, they've got children of their own. Uh, they perhaps have jobs. Okay? So the online model is also the only credible model of providing lifetime learning. You know, we hear a lot about this lifetime learning, right? That with the world changing so quickly, it's important to keep up, it's important to be re-educated and so forth. Online is really the only credible way of doing that because people who are 40, 50, 60, they're not going to go back uh, to the on-campus model. Sorry, can I just yeah. ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Um, the ratio of the fees was much less than the ratio of the number of students online and residents. Right. So does this result in lowering of the fees of the resident students also? Not really. Because that means yeah. that you have you know, 120 to 1700. Right. So you can actually share the benefits. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, let, me, let me come back to that in a few minutes, okay? Because I think that is an important question about uh, how these models are going to be funded and uh, uh, how they're going to be paid for. So let me, let me come back and try and deal with that. Yeah. A related question to that, uh, is there an element of cross subsidization between the two? Not, not that I know of, yeah. So it's not intended to be a cross subsidy, yeah. May, it's, yeah, it's a, that's a good question. It's not clear. Um, but I don't think, there can't be very much cross subsidy. So there's not intended to be cross subsidy. And the program is profitable. So the program is definitely profitable and that's why they're expanding it, in fact, to other programs. So the online version at 7,000 is making money. So that's kind of the key point. Okay. Um, now, let's think a little bit also, this is what we have now. Let's think about where we're going. Now, probably the very best model of education is sort of the Oxford tutorial model, where each student has got a tutor and looks at them individually and personally and so forth. This, of course, is far too expensive. We can't do this anymore. Right? This model is long, long gone. What we can do, however, is have an a AI tutor okay? and an artificial intelligence tutor is available 24 hours of the day, 365 days in the year, never gets cranky, never gets tired, okay? and an AI tutor is continually learning. So as a professor, uh, you gather experience with your students. And you see, okay, the student has made an error here, an error here, and you see, ah, I know what the student is misunderstanding. It's not understanding, because I see their errors. I see the pattern of the errors. And then you can direct the student to what they need. A AI tutor will use big data, hundreds of thousands, millions of students, to analyze the pattern of errors, and to direct each student on an individualized basis to just that piece of knowledge, just that piece of the jigsaw puzzle that they need to complete the picture. So AI and big data are going to come together in education. The way I put this is that the adaptive textbook will read you as you read it. And what I mean by that is that the artificial intelligence will be built into your textbook. So the textbook will be online, videos, you know, uh, assessment, questions, okay, exams, all online. And as you answer questions, if you get a bunch of questions right, then you'll move more quickly to the more difficult questions. If you get some questions wrong, you'll move back <coughs> to that, that area where you need practice. So the textbook will learn about you as you are learning the material. And in fact, we have this. This is beginning to happen right now. Uh, MindSpark, as some of you may know, okay, 
This is an Indian company, uh, which is an online learning system for mathematics, uh, also for Hindi. It's got 45,000 test questions in mathematics. It's used by over 400,000 students in India and elsewhere in, in the world. Uh, and it does exactly this. It dynamically customizes the material which is shown to students. So the students who are very good, who are moving quickly, it can move them to the most advanced material, which is just right for them. <coughs> students who are moving more slowly, it goes more slow. And it targets material according to the errors that you're making. Now, very recently, there's been a randomized control trial by uh, Kartik uh, Mulaharian and co-authors, okay, which looks at the mind spark. And it finds very large improvements in uh, mathematics uh, uh, ability using this program. Uh, an increase of 0.36 uh, standard deviations in math and 0.22 standard deviations in Hindi, which are very large uh, increases in the educational uh, area. And these are intent to treat effects. Uh, actual effects might be even larger than this. Um, the estimate there, there's greater learning at lower and financial and time cost than the default public spending. And of course, this can scale. And I want to point to one particularly important part of their paper, and that is this, is that it's not about the hardware, per se. It's about the software. And in particular, it's about the personalization. That seems to be making the biggest difference. Now, this was evaluated in um, a number of Delhi schools, actually. And a key problem in the schools is that, in these schools which were tested at least, which is probably representative, is that the same classroom had students of very, very different abilities. So what this shows, let's focus here on uh, the left. Okay. This shows the grade the student was uh, uh, enrolled in. This is the ability level of the student by grade. Okay. Now, sixth grade students are supposed to be learning the sixth grade material. Very, very few of them are at that level. And if you think, for example, about the ninth grade students, there were actually no students who were uh, achieving at that actual ninth grade level. So one thing is maybe the standards you know, are too high and they're moving too sharply uh, upwards because the standards are going up much faster than student ability is going up. So this is the actual student average progression. And it's uh, you know, a, 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 a less of a slope than the required progression. Moreover, what you can see is that in ninth grade, you know, there are some students performing at sixth grade, fourth grade level, okay? There's also some students performing at second grade level. And for a teacher to have a class in which some of her students are at sixth grade or seventh grade and others of her students are at, you know, third grade, this is impossible. You cannot teach one professor, one uh, teacher, cannot teach this heterogeneity of students. This is why the MindSpark program is important, because it personalizes. It is able to teach, learns very quickly, ah, this student is not at the ninth grade level, this student is at the fourth grade level, let's give them the material at the fourth grade and see if we can move them up. Because if you're in ninth grade, and you're at fourth grade level, and the student and the, prof and the teacher is teaching a ninth grade level, it's lost. It's nothing, right? And that you cannot catch up when you still have not achieved fourth grade level, and the teacher is teaching ninth grade material. It's all over. You're not going to learn. Is so this, this a, yeah. Is this the uh, Delhi school, or is it the low income school? Paper. Delhi schools. This is Delhi. This no, is. No, no, he did. There are two things. The RCT was done for low-income schools. See, MindSpark is being used on a for-profit yeah. for basis by lots of upper yeah. schools. I mean, the fancy schools. <coughs> no, no, yeah. no, no, that's but, a different product. That's the asset. No, no, but the Mind basic software. software. I mean, but then his paper, which he talked about, was that it was particularly effective. In fact, he said he had never seen such results. Yeah. His 20 years of work, yeah. which was for low income. Correct. Correct. So there, there wasn't the issue of not uh, diversity. It was that everybody, the, the, 
in sure. for ninety percent of the school, you were teaching two grades above where the people sure. were. Sure. So there was actually no education. Sure. Yeah. Both of those things are going on. Both right. of those things are going on. Absolutely. Okay. Let's turn a little bit now to talk about the destruction uh, aspect. Talk about the creative aspect. Let's talk about the destruction aspect. Um, this is uh, uh, Kim Tae Hoon. He is a superstar teacher in Korea. So he makes millions of dollars a year from teaching mostly online uh, students in Korea. And this I think we're going to see a lot more of because one aspect of online markets is that you are winner-take-all markets. So if you have a choice of uh, getting an online education from you know, a professor at Harvard or your local college, you're going to go to the best, the guy at Harvard, let's assume. Maybe not, right? But we'll <laughs> not always, but let's assume. So you're going to see a much more of a winner-take-all market. In online, small differences in quality become large differences in earnings. Okay. You only have to be a little bit better, and why not? Why not go to the guy who's even just a little bit better? So the guy who's a little bit better will have hundreds of thousands of students. The guy who is really pretty good, but not quite that good, he may have you know, 500 students. So we're gonna see a superstar market. Uh, it's interesting, you know, we always said you know, in the United States, you, you hear, things like, look at how much we pay our sports stars compared to how much we pay our teachers. Well now, we're going to pay teachers like sports stars, but there's going to be just as few of them. Okay? It's going to be fewer of them. And the market will be much more hierarchical. So you'll have the superstar teacher at the top, and maybe some tutors, assistants, okay? be kind of a much more hierarchical uh, model. Um, let's think about the costs of uh, providing these courses and what that means for how the market will be organized. So the primary uh, features of the cost in these markets is low marginal cost. So very cheap to teach an additional student or to teach the class a second time. However, there are high fixed costs. So to produce the class to have quality, to have animations, the guidance, the teaching assistant, the aid, the artificial the tutor, this can be high fixed cost. Because marginal cost is low, with competition, price will be low. And the competition will be in quality rather than on price. And the fixed costs, they're going to get much bigger. They're going to be endogenous fixed costs. And what I mean by that is the following. The competition will be like newspapers rather than like restaurants. So here's what I mean. Think about with restaurants going from a small market to a big market. Let's say, just for my uh, use, like Boise, you know, Idaho to New York. Okay? As you go from Boise, Idaho to New York or Mumbai or Delhi, much bigger market. What happens in restaurants? You get many more restaurants. And especially, you get more variety. So in Delhi or Mumbai, you can get Thai, you can get Chinese, you can get North Indian, South Indian, Calcutta, East Indian. You, know, you can get all variety, which you cannot get in a smaller market. So with restaurants, you get more restaurants, more variety. And now think about newspapers. Same thing, going from a small market, Boise, Idaho, to New York or something like that. Boise, Idaho would not be uncommon to have two or three newspapers. New York, two or three newspapers. So you don't get more newspapers. What happens instead in a larger market with newspapers is you get more investment in quality. So the Sunday section is, is bigger, has color photographs, it has better writers. The New York Times invests in a foreign bureau. Okay, uh, they have you know, as I say, color photographs, things like that. So the, what happens is quality, you get quality competition in the larger market. So and, yeah. Of course. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, that kind of a question. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you define quality? Is it just output, outcome? In this case, because it has so, to be limited in this context. So quality, uh, so what I'm defining as quality in this sense would be something that Everybody in the market basically thinks is better. So not variety, okay? 
okay, which is a different kind of measure of quality, but a vertical measure of quality. So, you know, a more material, a more book reviews is kind of better, right? So that's the kind of thing. Color photographs versus black and white, a foreign bureau versus not. That kind of thing, uh, you get more quality. So in the, t in, the, in the case of education, you'll get more animation, better production quality, things of that na nature that sort of everyone agrees is higher quality. Okay. So a way of thinking about this is that the market for courses will become much closer to the way the market for textbooks is now. So in the United States, there's maybe 8,000 teachers of principles of economics. Textbooks, so there's 8,000 courses. But in textbooks, the top four textbooks have about 50% of the market. So some of these textbooks you may have taught from, McConnell and so forth, and Albert O'Brien and uh, Krugman, and some of you may know that I don't like this book, this is the leading textbook, so you have to do, we could do much better than this, ah, uh, much better. This is my textbook. <laughs> <laughs> is this in the market? Yeah, 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 this is my book. <laughs> but the point is, is that courses will become much more like textbooks. So uh, integrated with videos and artificial intelligence and so on, and you'll have fewer of them, right? And it's interesting also that universities produce courses. Universities don't produce textbooks. So it's really a, a question, <coughs> who will be producing the courses? It might not be universities. It might be some combination of the new textbook uh, 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 firms, course firms. OK, so let me uh, uh, conclude by saying this. I think the future of education is actually like video games. And I say that not in a negative or a pejorative sense. But if we think about a video game like Halo, millions of dollars were invested in producing this video game, in hiring artists, computer programmers, sound programmers, actors, designers, even psychologists. Now why would a video game company, hire psychologists. It's because the ideal video game keeps the players at a constant, on the constant edge between achievement and, uh, fr between frustration and boredom okay, at that achievement level. If the video game players are being killed very quickly, they get frustrated. That's not fun. If you can't advance, it's not fun. You get frustrated. On the other hand, if the game is too easy, if you finish it too quickly, that's boring. Okay? So you want to keep the video game players just at that level where they are challenged, where they feel like they're achieving, they feel like they're getting ahead, okay? but it's still hard, it's still difficult, it's still a challenge. And if you think about education, that's exactly what we want to do in education. We want to keep our students just on that level between uh, frustration and boredom. We don't want them frustrated because the material is over their head. We don't, don't want them bored because it's too easy. You want to keep them just on that edge. And with online technologies, I think we're going to see a, a much more invested in an educational course. This goes back to your point about costs raised earlier. If, you have, if we have 100,000 students and the students are paying $20 each for the course, it makes sense to invest $10 in building the course, $10 per student. That's a million dollars invested in making a course. Now, in the history of education, there has never been a million dollars spent in producing a course, like a Principles of Economics course, or an Introduction to Psychology. But in the online world, it easily makes sense to invest a million dollars in producing a high-quality Introduction to Economics course. So I think that's what we're going to see, combination of textbook companies, authors, artists, psychologists will produce these courses <coughs> much higher quality. And it's kind of an uh, exciting future, but as the picture illustrates, it may be a little bit of a scary future. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.